Hey everybody, welcome to Car and Driver. I'm Carlos Lago, and that's a Tesla Model 3 that as of the time of this recording, we now have 45,000 miles on. It's been part of our long-term test where we try to put on 40,000 miles on a given vehicle. And we figure this amount of miles should tell us of any issues what an owner might experience in the first couple of years of ownership, and it reveals what it's like to live with on a car on a daily basis. Now, it also gives us time to run special tests, but we'll talk about those later. Like with every vehicle that goes through our long-term program, we measure every mile we drive, every dollar we spent, in the case of EVs, all the electricity we use too. And for this Tesla Model 3, we also measured battery degradation. Now we leased this car in 2019 for the tune of around $58,000 or so. And now two years later, what's the verdict? Well, it's complicated because of course it is. Let's start with the good, and that is how this thing drives. Uh, we really like the feeling of the steering. The handling has been pretty enjoyable. There's actually a willingness of this all-wheel drive car to rotate under power, and that's really nice, but the acceleration constantly received compliments. This thing was about a second quicker to 60 miles an hour than the previous Model 3 long range we tested, but that one had the single electric motor. For comparison, this one is a couple tenths, just a few tenths off the pace to 60 than the BMW M340i. But what's more impressive than that zero to 60 acceleration is what happens when you're already underway. The best way to demonstrate the feeling of the immediacy of a powerful EV is through our rolling start five to 60 mile an hour test. And in that case, this was nearly a second faster than that same BMW M340i. That's really impressive. And it's actually the kind of acceleration you experience the most on the freeway or on the road. What might be even more impressive though is that this is the first long-term car we've had that actually got more powerful while we owned it. It received an over-the-air update that increased power by 5%, and that netted a tenth of a second improvement in its zero to 60 acceleration and a three tenths of a second improvement to the quarter mile. That's really cool. The Tesla ownership experience is just as unique as the driving experience, or just as different as the driving experience, I should say, because a Tesla changes over time. Thanks to a constant stream of software updates, our car received 43 software updates over two years. And not all of these are substantial. A lot of them are just minor updates that follow major updates to address issues that came up from the major updates. But what this does mean though is constant change. And it's like what happens when your phone updates, your operating system updates, your favorite app updates, sometimes really cool new features are added and sometimes you wonder what the hell Instagram was thinking. But that brings us to one of the most common complaints in our logbook, and that is this car's near complete reliance on this screen for controlling most of its features. There's good and bad to this. Uh, on the good, this screen is industry leading with regard to fluidity and responsiveness. It also has a ton of really cool and fun features in it from karaoke to video games to you know, a way to broadcast your voice and the speakers. It's, there's a lot of fun stuff to be had in here. On the other hand, there's quite a bit of a learning curve to this screen. Uh, in fact, some of the younger members of our staff said they felt like what their grandparents must have felt like the first time they used an iPad. And new updates can change things, so sometimes you have to relearn some of these features. And then there are just some real boneheaded parts, like controlling the air vents through this screen is just dumb and it's even it's hard to do when you're driving it doesn't really ever work right and also the windshield wipers which in order to access and turn on you have to hit this control screen and switch on here and that isn't convenient when you leave it on auto the performance isn't that great either even after software updates that are meant to improve them and it really makes us question tesla's decision to use the front cameras for controlling the windshield wipers rather than a rain sensor like every other automaker does not making it easy to keep up with these frequent updates is the fact that Tesla requires a Wi-Fi connection to download software 
and won't do so through the built-in data connection. Plus, our initial 12 months of included premium connectivity expired, which meant in-car audio and video streaming now only works through Wi-Fi connections. And since not one of our area superchargers has Wi-Fi, we can no longer entertain ourselves with Netflix or YouTube while charging. It's a reason why we don't like these kind of subscription services. Build quality is a hot topic when talking about Tesla, uh, panel gaps and how things fit together. And this car certainly is much better than the very first Model 3 we tested. It has some panel gaps. It did exhibit some rattles and squeaks when we first got it, but they haven't gotten worse over time. This car, however, did leave us stranded on Christmas Day 2019. It actually broke while parked, which is a new one for us. One of our staffers who was visiting his parents received a push notification from the Tesla app that said the car had, quote, suffered a failure and will no longer drive. That the Model 3 broke down sucked, but its ability to notify us is pretty nifty. More impressively, Tesla roadside assistance got a tow truck to us in about half an hour on Christmas Day. We figured it would take some time for the repairs to take place because it was the holidays after all. We reported about the issue online and we're guessing this isn't a coincidence, but a couple hours after the story went posted or went public, the service center got a whole lot more responsive to us than they were at first. After initially ignoring a request for transportation, they then offered us a, either a loaner car, a rental car, or $100 a day in Uber credits. What broke? We learned a few days later. There was a short in the rear inverter, which the vehicle detected and blew the high voltage fuse to prevent damage to the battery. The service center replaced the entire rear motor assembly, along with the blown fuse and the 12 volt battery, and the Model 3 was ready to be picked up by the 31st. We initially shuddered to think what the cost would have been outside of warranty, but we learned it was $2,500, which was far less than what we anticipated. Since then, we haven't experienced any other significant issues. I mentioned at the outset that long-term tests give us more time to do unique tests that we wouldn't normally be able to do during like a one or two week loan. And that's exactly what we did with our Model 3. I'm gonna go over some of our findings, but if you want more information, you can always check these stories at carandriver.com. See these plastic wheel covers? We wanted to see what their effect was on efficiency. So we went to a automotive proving grounds and ran this car on a high-speed oval with and without them. We found they actually get you 10 miles of range. How does the climate control effect range? We went back to the same high-speed oval and ran this car at various climate control settings, including full blast heat with the seat heaters at their maximum setting, and that dropped range by 60 miles. Lastly, we were inspired by a snow-caused traffic jam uh, to see how long a Tesla or an EV could keep its cabin at a reasonably comfortable temperature should you get stuck in a weather-induced traffic jam. We let this car sit at the parking lot in our office in sub-freezing temperatures with the climate control set to its camp mode setting, which allows you to run the climate control while nobody's in the car, and we had it set at a target 65 degrees. We also did the same thing with a similar gasoline-powered sedan. We found that the Tesla could keep that temperature for nearly two days. It lost about 2.2% of its charge per hour, and that's barely less than a gasoline car. We have to talk about full self-driving capability. In 2019, we paid about $6,000 for that option. And as of today, that option costs nearly double and the feature still doesn't exist. Elon Musk has said that it will be available next year, but in fairness, he's been saying that for years. Select owners have been able to get into sort of a beta program of sorts where they get access to varying features of it but we haven't been able to jump through the digital hoops that are required to access that program because we don't meet the minimum safety score that Tesla asks for. We like to corner at above four tenths of a G. But what about the autopilot adaptive cruise control? Well, we've gone between being impressed and confused by its behavior. Sometimes it seems so smart that you think that full self-driving is just as imminent as Elon Musk would have you believe but other times it screws up such an easy maneuver that it makes you think that that technology is way farther off than we would all hope. 
you may want to think twice about spending real money today for a technology that may or may not exist in the future, but we can also put it another way. Had we simply invested that $6,000 into Tesla stock in 2019, today we'd have $85,000. What would you rather have? Also, not financial advice. Don't take financial advice from me, but I'd rather have the 85 grand. How much did our Model 3 cost to run? Well, intuitively, you would think that EVs would cost less than similar gasoline-powered cars because, after all, there's no oil changes or tune-ups. But during the course of our ownership, the cost savings was actually minimal. The Model 3's requirement that we lubricate the brake calipers every year or 12,500 miles, and that's something specified for areas that use road salt in winter months, like Michigan, that requirement has cost us nearly as much as normal oil changes, totaling $432 for three services, which often included tire rotation. Although that's less than what we spent on maintenance for our BMW M340i or Kia Telluride, that savings works out to between $6 to $15 a month over the course of two years of ownership, which would barely be noticeable on an owner's budget if they're spending $60,000 on a car. And then there are those part of living costs that we don't include with ownership but are part of life. Like for example, we had to replace the front windshield and glass on the roof due to rock chips. And that costs us $1,200 and $1,100 respectively. And because Tesla owns all of its service stations and keeps a tight control over parts availability, you have fewer options to choose from when you need to do those repairs. Then we get to tires. We went through the set of Michelin Primacy all-season tires on this car in about 30,000 miles, and we can get almost double that out of other all-season tires. Tire wear is an issue that we've seen complained about on the Model 3 forums, and we think that has to do with the fact that these Michelin tires come on the Model 3 with 20% less tread than they do in their off-the-shelf counterparts. What was our energy consumption and usage like? Well, living in Michigan is actually a benefit because we get to see how extreme cold affects range. In the most efficient month, June, with an average temperature of 81 degrees, we averaged 267 watt hours per mile. While in December, with winter tires installed and the average temperature of 34 degrees, it increased to 354 watt hours per mile. That equates to a 60 mile swing or 20% in expected range, depending largely on the outside temperature. And that's if it's plugged in overnight. Otherwise, the Model 3 can easily shed an additional 10 to 20 miles of range. At the national average residential electricity rate, at, as of the time of this recording, it costs us about 5.7 cents per mile to keep our Tesla charged. Note that some states, the cost is actually double, so you really gotta do your homework depending on where you live. Now, we bring that up because had we used Tesla supercharger networks solely to keep our Tesla charged, that cost would have risen to 11.3 cents per mile, which is much closer to what it costs us to keep our long-term BMW M340i filled with 93 octane premium fuel, and that was 15.3 cents per mile. This is all a big way of saying it's very important to have a high voltage charger at home in order to really reap the benefits of a EV's relative cost benefit to gasoline. Also, we used a third-party app called Teslafy to track battery degradation over time. And since the, the time that we bought this car to today, our batteries lost 7% or about 22 miles of range from its total figure. Now, should you buy a Model 3? Well, that depends on your tolerance for everything that we've just explained in this video, but let's lay it out here. Model 3 drives really well. The service experience can be really cool, but the rest can feel like a lot of what our digital age currently feels like, and that's good and bad reasons. Take, for example, the fact that the entertainment display has a lot of cool features, but it's always changing and has a big learning curve. The fact that you have to pay for subscription services to use some of these features. The fact that there's potentially revolutionary features that are just always out of reach or might be coming soon or something or whatever Elon's saying on Twitter. Now, if you don't mind all that, if you like using beta software, if you like the experience on your phone these days, you're probably a tech enthusiast that's gonna love your Model 3, and that's great, we're happy for you. But if you don't like all that stuff, you might wanna look elsewhere. <laughs>